Welcome to the Deeper Dive Podcast, brought to you by the OC Church of Christ. Let's dive deep into God's Word, learning new insight and taking a fresh look at the verses that impact our daily lives. We will continue with our study of the Minor Prophets by studying out the book of Habakkuk. Here is John Oakes. This week, the sermon is coming from the book of Habakkuk. And the theme is this, is God faithful? And is it okay for us as disciples, as followers of God, to question him? Now, Habakkuk is not one of the better known books in the Bible. I would imagine uh, if I asked uh, you to tell me what's Habakkuk about, most of you would say, uh, pretty sure it's in the Old Testament. Mm, not sure exactly where it is. Uh, Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. And here's how it goes. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. That's how you can find it. It's a short little book, and uh, but it's 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 a pretty amazing book. I think you're going to really enjoy our lesson from the book of Habakkuk. So let me give a little bit of background to the book. Uh, Habakkuk is prophesying around the year 607 BC, give give or take a couple of years. This is at a time uh, when uh, Jerusalem and Judah are about to come under judgment. Prophesied in Isaiah 39 five through seven. As we saw this morning in our Isaiah class, please come next Sunday, 9 o'clock. But that was about 90 years earlier. And so what's happening is God is going to come and he's going to do some bad things to some good people. And the question is, what does it mean when God allows bad things to happen to good people? This is something I think all of us wrestle with. Interestingly, the name Habakkuk means to embrace or to wrestle. And uh, that's a great name for Habakkuk, as you'll see as we, as we study this book, because is, is Habakkuk going to embrace God? Or is he going to wrestle with God? Or can we both embrace and wrestle at the same time? These are important questions. So anyway, in the year 605 BC, very soon after this prophecy of what's going to happen, as you'll see, Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem. Now you have to understand, before this time, in fact, let's look at the timeline here. You can see the timeline. Uh, Habakkuk, you have to squint a little bit. It's the green one about two-thirds of the way down. Habakkuk is a contemporary of Jeremiah. Both Jeremiah and Habakkuk were prophesying in Jerusalem. And you can see above there, the Assyrian Empire is, is, is under decline. It essentially falls. And at that time, the Babylonian Empire arises. And now the great power is Babylon and its young king, Nebuchadnezzar. So the question is, how is it that God can do such terrible things to his people through a people like Babylon who are sinners? All right, let's go back there. So 605 BC, like I said, um, Nebuchadnezzar comes. At that time, the, the king did not uh, lose in a war. Basically, uh, Judah decided to submit to Nebuchadnezzar and to pay tribute. And so what God did was he took, not God, yeah. what Nebuchadnezzar did was he took captives, he took hostages, and the hostages were the royal children. Let's see the prophecy in Isaiah 39 about this. Isaiah 39. This is, this is from our lesson just this morning. Isaiah 39. The background here is, is Hezekiah has been faithful to God, unlike Ahaz who came before him. And when the Assyrian king came, Hezekiah distrusted in God. And because of that, uh, Jerusalem was saved. But not too long afterward, some envoys from Babylon, which was not a major power at that time, some envoys from Babylon come and, and Hezekiah said, hey, y'all, come on in. Man, look at all this awesome stuff we have in the temple. We're pretty great. Maybe you and I can have an alliance. God is not happy about that because forming alliances with worldly powers, not a good idea. That's one of the main themes of Isaiah. And because of Isaiah's foolishness, uh, because of Hezekiah's foolishness, Isaiah gives the following prophecy in Isaiah 39 verse 5. 
Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. The year is 701 BC. 90 years later, Habakkuk is seeing this happen before his eyes. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away and they'll become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. We know who those people are. Those royal children are Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Those are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were indeed taken to Babylon and made eunuchs in his palace, which kind of explains why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego never had any children. Anyway, so um, so Judah submits, but unfortunately Jehoiachin rebelled a few years later. So eight years later, Nebuchadnezzar came back. This time he tore down part of the wall. He took 10,000 captives into uh, Babylon. That would include uh, Ezekiel. And, but he doesn't destroy the city. And he puts Zedekiah in place as king. And foolishly, Zedekiah rebels again, even though Jeremiah told him not to. So Nebuchadnezzar comes back 11 years later, and this time he completely tears down the wall. He burns Jerusalem to the ground and destroys the temple. And everything is carried off into Babylon, fulfilling the prophecy. Now imagine you're a Jew living at this time. You're thinking, we are God's people, and here are these sinful people coming in, and God's allowing them free reign to do whatever they want, to completely, utterly destroy us. Does God still love us? Is God with us? This is a question of what's called theodicy. Uh, now, that's a big word. Uh, I don't like to use too many big words, but I think this is a pretty good word, maybe to add to your vocabulary. I looked up a definition. Theodicy is the idea of the vindication of divine goodness and providence in view of the existence of evil. In other words, can a sovereign and loving God be consistent with evil and destruction and bad people having good things happen to them? And when these kinds of things happen, as I'm guessing some of us have had these things happen to our lives, we tend to ask, well, does God still love us? Maybe God's abandoned us. Maybe we're no longer his people. How can bad things happen? happen to good people. You know, sometimes it seems like despite the biblical statement that God is just, sometimes the world doesn't seem just at all. A lot of times kids will say to their parents, it's not fair, it's not fair. And mom or dad says, hey, the world's not fair. That's just the way it is. How is that consistent with the God of the Bible? That is the question that, that, um, um, that uh, Habakkuk is answering. Sorry about that. All right, let's go back to the book of Habakkuk. You know, these questions, I believe, are very relevant to us right now. Because recently we've had gone through a, a rough patch as a nation where the unjust have seemed to rule, where, where um, you know, Bad things have happened to some good people. And maybe you've had things in your own life. Maybe a, a job taken from you. Maybe uh, a spouse who's been unfaithful to you. Or maybe you've had a sickness or a, a close family member taken in their youth. And you're wondering, how could God allow that to happen? How can a faithful God allow these things to happen? So I believe this is relevant for sure for our country right now. But I, I would imagine it's probably very relevant for some of you right now in your life. So let's start in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Here's the outline. Basically, Habakkuk is going to complain to God, why are you letting this happen? And God answers that complaint. And then Habakkuk complains a second time. And God answers that complaint a second time. And then finally, Habakkuk throws up his hands and says, Amen, you are Lord, I'm going to trust in you. That's kind of the deal here. So let's look at Habakkuk's first complaint. The prophecy that Habakkuk, 
of the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but do you do not listen? Can you relate to that? I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Maybe you've felt this way. Maybe in your life you've said, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? And you don't answer my prayer. Can any of you relate to Habakkuk? God, are you even listening? I've been looking for a spouse for 20 years and nothing's happened. My son is caught up in addiction. I have chronic illness which limits my ability to do the things that I love to do. And I've always been faithful to God. I'm trying to provide for my family. And then I lost my job. My daughter is dealing with with a sickness that looks like it may even lead to her death. God, why is this happening to me? He says in verse 2, I cry out violence. But God, you don't save. Can anybody relate to that? Why, God, do you tolerate so much sin if you are a righteous and just God? It seems like the law is paralyzed and justice never wins out. Life is not fair. God, what is the deal? You know, Habakkuk, he's pretty pretty tough on God, isn't he? So is God going to strike him down with a bolt of lightning for questioning him? No. Is it okay for us to doubt and to question God? Absolutely it's okay. Let's go to Jeremiah 12, 1 and 2. Just another example. I like this example. Jeremiah 12, 1 and 2. Jeremiah, by the way, if you want an example of somebody questioning God's love and his justice, just spend some time in the book of of Psalms. But Jeremiah 12, 1 and 2, that's the one I picked. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. God, you are always right. You're always just. You always do the right thing. Yet, (laughs) I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You've planted them and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. It's interesting. Jeremiah starts by acknowledging the truth, which is God is always just and justice is always done. And he says, but God, having said that, I've got a real problem with the way things are working right now. Honestly, I don't agree with your plan here. God, why are you allowing this to happen? And again, just like with Habakkuk, God does not, you know, pulverize or beat down Jeremiah. In fact, God, as a loving God, listens patiently because Jesus understands, because Jesus was tempted in every way as we are. Let's read Habakkuk 1, 5 through 11. So basically, Habakkuk says, why? How long must I wait for a reply to my prayer? And this is God's first answer, verse 5 through 11. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. Now, after you hear verse 5, you go, awesome, great, you're going to do something great. And then he says, actually, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to destroy you. (laughs) That's his answer to Habakkuk's complaint. Interesting, huh? I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth to seize the dwellings not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves, and they promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry 
uh, gallops headlong. The horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all, they, they all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and they gather prisoners like sand. <coughs> they mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen ramps they, that capture them. Then they sweep past like the limb, wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their god, Marduk. This is not a very satisfactory answer to Habakkuk, I think. God says, I'm going to do something utterly amazing in your lifetime. Something so amazing that nobody would have believed it, even if they were told. By the way, I've heard this verse taken out of context. Somebody saying, you know, God is going to do awesome things to you guys. You're going to just baptize lots of people. You're going to plant a church. Okay, uh, wrong verse to use for that, okay? <laughs> well, kind of out of context. When Habakkuk receives this prophecy, Assyria has lost their power. And the Babylonians are just coming into their place. But very soon after he received this prophecy, exactly what it says here is what happened. God says, I'm going to raise up Nebuchadnezzar, a very youthful king. They will come and they will destroy Judah. And Habakkuk's thinking, that's your answer to my prayer? Will God use bad people and institutions to bring about his will in our lives? You know, that's a good question. Will God use an unrighteous boss to help you? Will God allow selfish and greedy people to bring evil into your life and use it to bring about his will in the long run? What about Romans 5.28? God brings, uh, 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 brings to good all things for those who are called according to his purpose. Habakkuk 1, 12 uh, through 2, 1. So this is going to be Habakkuk's second complaint. And you can see kind of why Habakkuk has a second complaint. The second complaint is not exactly the same as the first complaint. The first complaint is, God, why are you allowing, allowing bad things to happen? And God says, I'm going to use the Babylonians here. And so the second complaint is essentially, well, why the Babylonians? Excuse me, why the Babylonians? All right, so... Starting in verse 12, uh, he says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. Kind of like Jeremiah, he starts out by acknowledging God's sovereignty. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Have you ever felt that way? you ever wondered about that? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. Again, he's talking about Babylon here. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch. I will station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. So this is Habakkuk's second complaint. complaint. He says, you know what, God? I get it. I understand you. You don't tolerate sin. You're a righteous God and you will do what you will. But why would you use the Babylonians? They're more sinful than we are. Fact. They're more idolatrous and adulterous than we are. True. He says in verse 13, God, if I understand you correctly, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You can't tolerate wrongdoing. 
then why then are you going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment on your people? I get it, God. You are holy, holy. Like we saw in Isaiah 6 in our class. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You don't tolerate sin. But there's a ton of sin you seem to be ignoring right now. God, help me out. This does not work for me logically. You sit silent while people abuse me. You allow the arrogant to overcome the humble. Why don't you do something about this? Why are you silent in the face of this evil, especially that of the Babylonians? You know what? Habakkuk is really asking the wrong question here. But who am I to judge? The right question when bad things are happening to you is, what is God trying to do in my life right now? That's what Habakkuk should have been asking. Why is God doing this? What sin in our life is God trying to root out through this situation? What do I need to change? What is God trying to tell me? Because I know in spite of all the obvious things happening, I know in my heart that God is love and God is sovereign and God rules the nations. But you know what? Habakkuk is human and God is not terribly angry at Habakkuk right now. I don't believe so anyway. In fact, God is patient with Habakkuk and he allows him to ask the question that I believe you and I find ourselves asking because we're human beings. So in verse 15 and 16, he says, the wicked foe pulls them up like with hooks and he's, these fat cat, rich, arrogant rulers are taking our peasant Jews and they're grabbing up their, in their hooks and they're taking them off into captivity. How is that right, God? How is that consistent with what we know about you? He's basking in his wealth and he's treating the nations unfairly. He, he's like a mass murderer. Why, God? Why are you treating us this way? I love Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. This is a great passage. This is a good memory verse. Why don't you contemplate this verse this week? Although we got two other great verses to contemplate, so keep some space there. He says, I will stand at my watch and I will station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I'm to give to his complaint. So basically, Habakkuk says, all right, despite all this, I'm having these emotions, these feelings, I'm complaining to God. He says, you know what? I'm going to wait for God. I'm going to wait for his answer. You know, you could read chapter 2, verse 1, either as Habakkuk's almost kind of being sarcastic. It's like, all right, yeah, I'm waiting for answer, God. Good, good luck coming up with an answer to this one. You could almost think of him as being sarcastic here. Or you could think of him as being really faithful and saying, you know, that's how I read it. I will keep watch and I will see and I'll wait for him to speak to me. And if I have to wait for 30 years, I'll wait for 30 years. I, I like to think that's what Habakkuk is saying. So let's see God's answer. Because like I said, complaint, response, complaint, response, I give up. Okay, so we're going to look at God's, whoop, God's uh, response, his second response. I'm going to read Habakkuk 2. I'm going to break it up into two parts. It's 2 through 19. I'm going to read 2 through 4, and then I'll read the rest. So Habakkuk 2, verse 2. The Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. That's Nebuchadnezzar. But... The righteous person will live by his faithfulness. That's God's response. Yeah, it's true. Nebuchadnezzar is puffed up and arrogant and 
I'm using a person that, you know, is not a particularly righteous guy. But he's saying, here's the deal. Wait for me. You can mark it down. I will come to judge the sinner. You can mark it down. All will come out right in the end. God, That is God's promise. And if God promises, I think we can assume it's going to happen. He talks about the end in verse 3. He says, you know, the, the, God sometimes judges in two ways. He, he may come back and judge the situation. But in the end, at the end of time, everything will be made right. Right? In, in Romans 12, uh, verse uh, 18, it says, I will avenge. I will repay. God ultimately will deal with things. So our job is to do what it says right here. The righteous person will live by faith. God says to Habakkuk and to to you and me, I get it. Believe me. I see the evil. I know what's happening. I mean, I am after all sovereign Lord, but I'm telling you, just trust in me. I have uh, what I have the, the good in mind for you. Habakkuk 2.4. This is the key. In fact, this is one of the key verses, I'm not kidding, in the entire Bible. Uh, Paul quotes Habakkuk in Romans 1.17 in what's probably the theme verse of the entire book of Romans. And he says the key of all of it is those who through faith are righteous will live. And then in Galatians 3.11, he says, The righteous will live by faith. Let's read the version in Hebrews 10.38. This verse, Habakkuk 2, verse 4, is perhaps the most quoted Old Testament scripture. Probably not quite, but close. Hebrews 10, verse 38. He says, uh, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we not, do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So, yeah, bad things happen to good people. And God will use even evil for good. But here's the question. Are you going to have faith in God? Are you going to believe in God's justice even when you can't see it? Oh, isn't that the next verse right there? Right after the Hebrew writer quotes, my righteous person will live by faith. What's he say in Hebrews 11.1? 1? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. If you do not see the end to your situation, if you don't see the solution, if you can't even see why God would let that happen, Faith is belief in God's justice, his righteousness, his love, in spite of what can be seen with the eye. That's the message of Habakkuk. Trust in God. Trust in his ultimate righteousness. Because I tell you this, at the end of time, it will all be made right. God always delivers on his promises. And this is God's promise to you, verse 4 through 12. I'm going to read read verse 4, and I go through verse 12, back in Habakkuk 2. See, the enemy's puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him, he is arrogant and never at rest, because he's greedy as the grave, and like death is, is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations, takes captive to all his peoples. Now, this is Nebuchadnezzar, but this is whatever in your life, whatever the equivalent thing is for you. Will not all of them taunt him and ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you've plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone on in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. 
You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city without, with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. God says, woe will come on the un unrighteous. You can mark it down. In fact, there are five woes here. And woe means the opposite of blessing, right? We got blessed are the pure at heart, but uh, not blessed. Woe on the uh, impure of heart. In chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long should this go on? So woe on the greedy. Also, woe on those who exploit the, 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 those not in power. Verse 9, Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. But if you read on, he will destroy those people. Woe on those who use violence in order to get their way or intimidation. Verse 12, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Also, woe on those who practice immorality and get seek pleasure through immorality. In verse 15, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so you can gaze on their naked bodies. Woe is coming on those people. Does it seem like that right now? No, right now they're sitting in their plush palaces and enjoying vacations and everybody says they're awesome. But God's justice will come. It will roll on like a river, like we saw last week. And then the fifth woe is woe on the idolaters, those who put things above God. Verse 19, woe to him who says to the wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. And of course, those aren't our idols, but you know what the idols are. We've talked about them many times. People are relying on things of the world and God's saying, woe to them. So that's God's promise that that right will win out over evil in the end. Now we have our second amazing, like perfect memory verse, Habakkuk 3, 13 and 14. By the way, this is in the middle of God's second response. All right. So let's read verse 13 and 14. Some pretty cool stuff here. All right. Uh, it says, has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's where we're headed. That is the final state of mankind. I just want you to stop and just get a picture. I've got a nice little picture up on the screen there says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That's where we're headed. The mockers, the scoffers, the prideful, the arrogant, the idolaters, the violent. Theirs will be the place in hell in the second death. But it'll all work out in the end because like it says here, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. That's how it will be at the end. This will be the final state of mankind. My question is, do you believe that? Can you trust in God's love? Can you trust in his theodicy? God says, it's going to all shake out in the end. Like I already quoted in Romans 12, 19. I will avenge. I will repay. Now let's read on. He says, this is what's going to happen to the wicked. Verse 15 through 19. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wine skill to their drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup of the Lord's right hand is coming against around to you, and it disgrace will cover your glory. That's what will happen to the unfaithful. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. 
For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or the image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. For he makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to a lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? Is It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. No. God says, woe is coming on those who lean on violence and idolatry. And when God says it's going to happen, folks, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I guarantee it. Numbers 23, 19. Let's read that one. God is always faithful. God fulfills every single promise that he ever made. Numbers 23, 19. It says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? God always fulfills his promise. Now, did Habakkuk feel that way? No, he wasn't feeling that way at all. Are you feeling that way right now? Maybe not. God says, that's okay. He says, look, those who live by faith, the righteous will live by faith. Just believe me. Now, back in Habakkuk, we have our third Really cool, uh, great verse for thought for the week, or maybe a, a memory verse. It's Habakkuk 2, verse 20. All right, there we go. So what's the end of the, of the matter? I mean, and basically, this is the end of God's response. After Habakkuk 2, 20, God's done talking. I've said all I have to say. And basically, what he says is, I promise you this, I will deal with the ungodly. And then in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Be still and know that I am God. Have you struggled wondering if God really loves you? Wondering if it's worth it? Habakkuk can relate. He can definitely relate because God was about to come and destroy everything that he valued. And yet God says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Let us be still and know that he is God. That's the end of the matter. Does that mean it's simple? It's easy? No. Nobody ever said that. No. But it's the truth. It's the God's honest truth. Like I already said, in the end, this is what's going to happen. This is the same God who raised Jesus from the dead, the God who created the universe, the God who gave us the book of Habakkuk. Now, the rest of Habakkuk, basically, he's basically just giving a, a poem. At this point, Habakkuk has said, Amen. Amen. You know what? I'm just going to trust in the Lord. Oh, the end of Habakkuk is so beautiful. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is one of the most quotable books in the entire Bible. So let's read Habakkuk 3, starting in verse 2. And it's just a beautiful poem of praise to God. God, I'm just going to trust in you. So let's read it, starting in verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known in wrath. And remember mercy. God came from Timan, the Holy One from Mount Paran. 
His glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the whole earth. He's remembering back to the glory days when, when he called Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hands where his power had been hidden. A plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled. The age-old hills collapsed. But he marches on forever. I saw the tents in Kushan in distress, the dwellings in Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow, you called for many arrows, you split the earth with rivers, the mountains saw you and writhed, torrents of water swept by the deep, deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows and at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader in the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head. With his warriors, when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, right? In the sea, Red Sea. Gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, I wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation evading us. Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait patiently for the Lord. So it's interesting here. He talks about your anointed one in verse 13. This is one of the very few times when the anointed one is not Messiah. The anointed one is, is God's people. You know, God is awesome beyond description. He will vindicate those who are faithful to him. When? I don't know. How? I have no idea. Who will he use to do it? I can't say. But one thing I know, it's going to happen. He says in, in verse 1, in verse 2, I stand in awe of your deeds. It basically says, just Repeat them in our day. Just make great things happen. He says, His glory covers the heavens and they fill the earth. Kind of like that earlier verse in chapter 2. His splendor is like the sunrise. He says, He rides uh, in horses and chariots to victory. He says in verse 13, when you come out to deliver your people, you crush the leaders of the wicked. Oh, yes, God, you are the faithful one of Israel. And then he has got to be one of the most beautiful, amazing uh, poet, pa passages of poetry in the whole Bible. Ephesians, I'm sorry, Habakkuk 3, the second half of verse 16 through the end. Let's read this together. So beautiful yet i will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation evading us though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls yet i will rejoice in the lord I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to, tr to tread on the heights. Kind of sounds like Isaiah 40, doesn't it? it says, I'm going to wait on the Lord. Can you wait patiently? For the Lord to vindicate you? How long? I don't know. How? I wish I could say. It might not be till after you die. It may be on judgment day. 
verse 17. Let me just read it again. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though everything seems to be going terrible and my life seems to be going into a bottomless pit, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food and there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Just not because of what's happening, but in spite of what's happening around me, I'm going to choose to be joyful in my God. These other things, they could never save me anyway. Only God can save me. And he says in verse 19, my strength is in the Lord. The there, there is that word sovereign. The sovereign Lord is my strength because Habakkuk acknowledges the sovereignty of God. God rules the nations. And if we will do this, then it says here, it's a promise. God will make our feet like those of a deer and he will lift us up. God is good. Do you believe that? Habakkuk did. So, conclusion. Conclusion. You know what? It's okay to question God's love and his justice. It's kind of the human thing to do. And because Jesus came here as a high priest of our salvation, he's been tempted in every way just like we have. And he's felt those same feelings. It's okay. Don't feel guilty for doubting God. It's okay. So what you ought to do is just tell him. Let them know what you're thinking and feeling. But when we question God, we need to hold on to our faith that despite what we can see, God's ways are above our ways. God is sovereign even when it doesn't seem that way because faith is belief in things unseen. And not only that, but we need to be patient. How long? I don't know. Hopefully tomorrow. I hope so. Hopefully for you it's tomorrow. Or for sure next month. Or maybe 20 years. Or maybe not until he comes back. We need to be patient. We need to wait for God to act in his time, not in our time. And we need to doubt our doubts. It's okay to have those doubts, but you need to be willing to doubt those doubts. And instead... Do what Habakkuk did, which is which is he claimed the promises. He listened to God's answer. And here's the truth of the matter. The righteous will live by faith. Thank you, John Oaks. And thank you all for listening to Deeper Dive by the OC Church of Christ. If you want to get connected to us or want to donate to the program, go to our website, occhurchofchrist.com or through social media at the OC Church. Join us next time as we continue our deeper dive into the minor prophets.